Hello everyone, Evan here, and thanks for tuning in to Vue.js Live. Today, I'll be talking about what's been going on after one year of Vue 3's release, what has changed, what was shipped, and some of the lessons we've learned along the way. And most importantly, we'll also talk about what's coming next. Vue 3 was released on September 18th, 2020. It's crazy to think that it's been out for over a year already. Over this past year, we shipped another two minor versions, 3.1 and 3.2. 3.1 was mostly focused on the migration build, and 3.2, which we'll talk about a bit later, shipped a ton of new improvements. And in between that, we had 52 patch and pre-release versions. Today, V3 has crossed 1.2 million downloads per month, but many of you are probably wondering why haven't we switched Vue.js.org and npm tags to default to Vue 3 yet? The short answer is, it will happen very, very soon. The longer answer is, well, it was planned, but only to some extent. When Vue 3 was first released, we knew it wasn't ready for mass, instant mass adoption. Most notably, some core libraries were still in beta. The new DevTool extension wasn't ready, and IDE support and the tooling story were both lacking. In addition, major ecosystem projects like Nuxt and Vuedify also needed time to come up with a Vue 3 compatible version. So we intentionally opted for a soft launch strategy. This would allow early adopters to start using Vue 3 um, giving, while giving us time to stabilize core and give the ecosystem the time to catch up. But we have to admit, this soft launch took much longer than we had hoped. Here, I'm going to be completely honest and discuss some of the lessons that we have learned. The main issue that caused the ecosystem around Vue 3 to move slower is the breaking changes between Vue 2 and Vue 3. Because of the breaking changes, it was challenging for existing projects to migrate. With fewer end users moving to Vue 3, Library author authors also had weaker incentives to upgrade their libraries to support Vue 3. And because many libraries did not support Vue 3, end users were unable to upgrade their projects. So you see we were in a kind of deadlock here. This was addressed to some extent via the migration build, but it was also shipped a bit late, right? It was shipped in July 2020, uh, July 2021 so much later than we had hoped. In an ideal world, we obviously wanted to make Vue 3 100% backwards compatible. However, in reality, it involves some extremely difficult trade-offs. Imagine re-engineering a propeller into a jet while it's flying. Well, maybe that's a bit too exaggerated, but let me dive a bit deeper into this. What kind of updates do we consider major? Note that I am not talking about a semver major. I'm talking about something that we typically only do to a framework maybe once every few years, right? The common reasons for such major updates include, first, to correct architectural design flaws. Second, to introduce fundamental new capabilities. And three, to shed technical debt of the existing architecture. Note, these usually involves mass refactoring or even ground up rewrite, which was the case for Vue 3. The common traits of, the, of, the, of these import, uh, core reasons are that they are extremely expensive to do in an incremental fashion, right? Um, because some of the issues are rooted in the architecture and without overhauling the architecture, some of the improvements were simply not possible in the first place. So, uh, doing such big updates while uh, retaining fully backwards compatibility is sometimes just prohibitively expensive to do, right? Why? Because full backwards compatibility is a burden that compounds with every major new change introduced. The more ambitious the new changes are, the more technical debt will incur during the process. Um, in the long run, it will make the process even harder, adding new features much harder, and most importantly, it becomes more and more costly to maintain the software in the long run. Now, on the other hand, we can reduce the scope of changes in order to make things more feasible. 
but this also results in less ambitious improvements, fewer possibilities explored, and potentially stagnation, right? So it's almost like there are a bunch of knobs that you can try to turn, but when you turn one of them, the other ones will move in reaction to the one you're turning. So here I visualized the, some of the factors that we have to consider while doing major updates um, into four knobs, right? There, these are backwards compatibility, how easy it is to upgrade, the cost to implement and maintain the changes and maintain it in for the long run, and finally the level of improvements these changes can bring about. So um, in the case of Vue 3, the, um, the example is if we turn the backwards compatibility to 100%, this will reduce make it extremely easy to upgrade, but it will also significantly increase the implementation and maintenance costs. And if we try to push the scale of an improvement up to 100% at the same time, it will drive up the cost to nearly infeasible scale. Now, if we turn the compatibility knob down a little bit to 90%, we can now have both reasonable cost and somewhat major improvements, but user upgrade will suffer right? The, it will become more difficult to upgrade. So this essentially sums up the trade-offs that we have, uh, we have opted for in Vue 3, right? We try to keep the majority of the framework concepts and APIs intact while introducing new capabilities. Um, so the API is 90% compatible. It's not 100% compatible. Most importantly, some of the internals have changed, right? But we were able to bring major updates in almost every aspect, from performance to bundle size to internal architecture, long-term maintainability, TypeScript integration, right? It's an improvement across the board. Unfortunately, we also had to introduce some of the small breaking changes. Um, many of the public API changes are now covered in the Compat build. However, some of the exchanges are found more fundamental. For example, the switch from using ES5 getter setters to proxies for the reactivity system, or changing the underlying virtual DOM format. These changes were necessary for the level of improvements that we were aiming for. However, they also made it more challenging for existing projects to upgrade, especially apps with external dependencies that rely on Vue2's internal behavior. This is the biggest blocker that we've, we have seen in, in practice. Now, I'm not trying to look for excuses by talking about all this. Looking back, we probably could have done some things a lot better, uh, especially with the breaking changes, to make the upgrade process smoother. We could have introduced the compact build earlier, and we definitely should have worked on the new docs earlier as well. But ultimately, I still believe making Vue 3 100% backwards compatible, especially with all the libraries that relied on Vue 2's internal behavior, was something that was just too costly to commit to. Uh, we won't be able to get the level of maintainability and the level of improvements that we want, we, that we have right now at the same time, if we commit to 100% backwards compatibility. So um, enough about the, the breaking changes, but now let's talk about something more optimistic. The good news is, I believe the turning point is very close and we will see Vue 3's adoption grow significantly in 2022. Now, outside of Vue itself, one of the reasons that this major uh, this switch to Vue 3 by default has been delayed for so long is that we spent a lot of time on stabilizing Vite. So this is kind of a detour which we hope will be worth it in the long run. Vite is a brand new build tool that greatly improves development experience with blazing fast server startup time and hot module replacement performance. Now, today Vite has already crossed 1 million monthly NPM downloads and being actively used in many production projects. We will also be switching our recommended tooling for Vue 3 to a Vite-based setup very soon. If you haven't tried Vite yet, trust me, it's going to knock your socks off, so definitely go try it, check it out. Anthony from our team and Vite team and Alex from Vue School are both going to talk about Vite in their talks, so, um, definitely keep an eye on those. While my primary focus is still on Vue, as an open source developer, my ultimate goal is to help other developers do their jobs faster. So that's why I'm particularly proud that although Vite was initially created specifically for Vue, it has now evolved into a framework agnostic tool. 
that can benefit all web developers. Another aspect for increased V3 adoption is that IE11 is, is going out at a faster pace. Since Vue 3 no longer supports IE11, this has been one of the concerns for many users, right? The good news is um, more and more major players are dropping support for IE11. One of the recent one is Google Search, um, now officially dropping IE11 supporting its main product. It still has a fallback experience, but they essentially said we're not going to invest more support into IE11. And here's what they said, we did the math, it is time. So hopefully this will also send a signal to more and more companies to start dropping IE11 together. The most important thing and um, probably what we as users care most about is that the ecosystem is really catching up now. Nux3 just recently entered public beta with tons of improvements, amazing features. Many of you are probably have been waiting for this and uh, Alex from the next team will talk about it very soon. View Use is another project that manifests the power of Composition API. It's a huge collection of Composition API utilities ranging from browsers, APIs to device sensor APIs, bridges to animation to state management. The best part is you can use as many of them as you want in your project um, without any of the drawbacks of mixings. Right? No namespace conflicts, fully supports tree shaking. Um, so definitely check it out if you haven't. Now, if you're looking for UI component frameworks, there are also already many choices that are stable for Vue 3. Quasar 2 is already stable. Vuetify is currently still in alpha, but will reach beta in December. John Leader will talk about this probably in his talk. There are also other great choices such as Naive UI, Prime View, Element Plus, and Design View. And if you're building something specific for mobile, there are great choices too, right? Ionic View uh, is built on top of Vue 3 from the ground up. There are also Vue 3 compatible versions of the Vant UI and uh, a new project called Valet. So also check these out if you're building for mobile. In addition to the ecosystem, we also shipped more improvements in Vue itself in 3.2. The most important new feature in 3.2 is script setup, which significantly improves the ergonomics when using Composition API inside single file components. Um, now, due to the time constraints, I'm not going to show off every single feature in 3.2, but um, after the talk, check out the, this, this, uh, these slides. There are links to everything I mentioned. Um, we also had an announcement blog post for 3.2, so check those out if you're interested. Um, we also greatly improved the IDE support uh, for view single file components via the Vola extension, which is now the new recommendation. So if you're still using Vitor, definitely consider switching over to Vola to check it out. And WebStorm has also been doing a great job in keeping up with our latest syntax additions. So WebStorm now already supports script setup as uh, in view single file components as well. We now also have a dedicated tool called ViewTSC, which can type check view components with, alongside normal TS files. So it can treat both view files and TS files in the same project as one type checking pass. You can this in your CI build pipelines. So you don't have to, um, so you can rely on the IDE instant feedback during development and then run this during build or during CI. 3.2 also shipped major performance improvements for the reactivity system. And for in terms of rendering, there's also the new vMemo directive, which gives you the opportunity to do very fine-grained tweaking, many optimizations in cases where it's extremely demanding. Now, um, but in most cases, the rendering performance is already pretty great. right? Um, and finally, we have some pending RFCs that can potentially introduce even more ergonomics improvements for Composition API. For example, the Ref Transform IFC that allows us to use refs with reactivity, but without the need to use dot value everywhere. So if you have been bothered by dot value, definitely check out this RFC. So we believe these combined together will push Vue 3 to a whole new level. But of course, we also want to help Vue 2 users 
to either migrate or if you can't benefit from some of the new fe uh, these new improvements so first of all we ship the migration build in 3.1 that can help eligible projects incrementally migrate to v3 um, typically what we found is you should be able to migrate to v3 via migration build unless you have some hard dependencies that are irreplaceable but also rely on uh, internal view, view two behavior now library authors our recommendation for library authors is to write uh, most of your logic using composition api and then you can target both view 2 and view 3 via the view dummy utility it automatically detects the right version of view and then um, aliases your apis to the right version view 2 users can also enjoy the speed of vite via vite plugin view 2 and you can even start using script setup with view 2 via unplugging script setup view 2. now uh, both these plugins uh, are, are, are authored by core team members. We also haven't forgot about 2.7. So uh, the main thing that we want to do in 2.7 is to backport Composition API back into Vue 2 so that Vue 2 users no longer need to use an external package in order to use Composition API. This is planned for Q1 2022. Last but not least, we're working on a complete overhaul of Vue.js.org. I wish we had done this sooner, but I am very, very excited for this iteration because it brings about so many improvements. As you can see, there will be brand new designs with dark mode. The site is completely rebuilt on VitePress. VitePress is the successor to ViewPress, which uh, is now built on top of Vue 3 and Vite. Uh, it can static, statically generate the site from Vue and Markdown. Updated rec the, the new docs will contain updated recommendations and best practices. Um, there are very scattered information about what is the best option to use, what you should use, what you should, how you should set up a project for Vue 3, right? It's kind of all over the place in the current docs and of all the information that's been around. So the new docs will consolidate all of them and there will be the de facto recommendation. And you can, you can go there, you can, you can find what is the best way to do things. And we have also restructured the learning paths, right? So we divide the new content into three major parts, the guide, the examples, and the tutorial. So the guide will have many rewritten parts to update, to reflect the latest best practices. And more importantly, the guide will be written in a way that it, it has the same flow, the same concepts, but you can toggle between options API and composition API to see how they compare or just stick to the API that you prefer during the learning process. All the examples will also be available in both API styles, and there are many new examples as well. Um, there will be rewritten introduction and framework overview, Q&A page, and a brand new tutorial for hands-on learning. So as I have mentioned, the switch from view two to view three is right around the corner. It will happen as soon as the new docs are ready. And that will be very soon. After that, Vue.js.org will default to the new docs for Vue 3. NPN disk tags for Vue and other core libraries will all point to Vue 3 versions by default. The GitHub repos will, stay, will, will still be kept separate. This is mainly because we want to preserve the issue links since they are an important resource for users searching from Google and trying to find answers to past issues. So uh, we will keep the repo separate. Instead, we will rename the view next repo to vjs slash core. And that's it. I can't wait to show you the new vjs.org once it's done. And I hope you're as excited as I am. So thank you very much.